Good morning and welcome or good afternoon if you're in Europe and welcome to uh, the latest Carnegie event. My name is Dan Baer and it's a pleasure today to have you with us. Uh, we have a great conversation coming up. One of the silver linings of the pandemic era is that even though we can't hug our family and friends, we can see friends and colleagues from across continents and across oceans and we are trying to take full advantage of that here today. We have a wonderful conversation coming up and I just wanted to say a few words at the outset uh, to set the context. Um, when we talk about transatlanticism, particularly in the United States, uh, often we see it through the narrow lens of NATO. Uh, and when we talk about the US-Europe relationship today, we often hear uh, more focus on the strain and the difficulty than we do on the possibility. And we'd like to widen the aperture on both fronts, uh, both because we think that the future of the US-Europe relationship has a much wider and broader sense than just a defensive alliance, and that there's a broad affirmative agenda for the US and Europe to work on, particularly in the US-EU relationship. And also that, well, today there may be a lot of focus on strain, that this remains an indispensable relationship and one about which we have optimism for the future. Uh, because if there can be an analog to the, uh, to the old saying that with great power comes great responsibility, with great challenge in this case comes great opportunity. And uh, Eric and I actually released a, a compendium of essays last week from a variety of European and American leaders about the potential of the future of this relationship, but we will hear from two people who know it better than uh, perhaps anyone. And we have an American in Europe and a, a European and American today uh, in America today. Um, we're thrilled to have uh, Ambassador Emily Haber from the German Embassy, the German ambassador to the U.S., who had a long diplomatic career in the German Foreign Ministry uh, before coming to Washington and dealing with this uh, unusual uh, time for an assignment. She uh, was state secretary at the German Foreign Ministry before she came to this latest assignment. And we're thrilled to have her with us, particularly because Germany is uh, in the presidency of the EU at this moment. Uh, and we have uh, Ambassador Tony Gardner, who uh, Ambassador Gardner and I went to uh, what the US diplomats call charm school together when you train before you go out overseas. And I quickly realized that uh, I would not be uh, the smartest kid in the class within uh, a few hours because Tony has always been just an incredibly thoughtful and reflective uh, diplomat and obviously had a long career in public and private service before he served as President Obama's ambassador to the EU. Uh, to moderate this morning's discussion, we have, oh, oh and I should say, the other, the other great thing about Tony is that he has uh, recently released uh, a book about his time uh, as ambassador to the EU. And we were talking just before we got started here about how uh, it really is a practitioner's Bible. Uh, and it covers a range of issues with, with both the substance and um, the intrigue, if I may, um, about how we can build this relationship uh, in the future. Uh, my colleague, Eric Bratberg, will uh, moderate th this morning's discussion. Eric is the director of the Europe program at Carnegie uh, in Washington, DC, and uh, a close colleague of mine, and uh, has had a career. Uh, we're, we're glad to call him uh, a European American, uh, uh, and glad that his career has brought him to our shores, uh, and hope he stays here for a long, long time. Eric, over to you. Well, thank you so much, Dan. Thanks for that uh, terrific uh, introduction. And also, I want to welcome our two uh, distinguished speakers, Ambassador Tony Gardner and Ambassador Emily Haber. Just one quick word of housekeeping before we get underway. Uh, we hope that uh, everyone is watching will submit questions, and you have three different options for doing so. You can send us an email to europe at CEIP, or you can use the YouTube chat function and just type in your question, or you can tweet us using the Twitter handle Carnegie and Dow and the hashtag Ask Carnegie. So we very much look forward to, to your questions uh, during this event. Um, but I wanna jump straight into uh, this conversation. And I wonder, uh, Ambassador Gardner, if I can turn to you first. I mean, you've written this, um, as Dan mentioned, this marvelous book, this uh, insider's account on the EU-US relationship um, and how this relationship actually works in practice. Uh, so as someone who's spent I think over three decades, starting off as an intern in the European Commission in the early 1990s, um, working on this relationship between the United States and the European Union. Um, what's the overall message that you hope to convey to Americans about why they should care about the EU? There are a lot of other issues that they, that they should care about. You know, why is it, as you described, 
that these two and these two players, the United States and the European Union, are indispensable partners in an increasingly turbulent world. You know, what does that actually mean in practice? And can you give us some uh, examples from your own experience? Thank you for that softball question, Eric. <laughs> and thank you, Dan. And thank you, Ambassador, for doing this. Very kind of you. So sometimes I feel like a preacher, a preacher for the EU. And I have to tell you, it isn't easy because the EU is not an easy organization to understand. My daughter, when I told her I was going to write this book, said, don't write the book. It's going to be boring and no one will read it. It's a story I recount in, in my book. I also recount how Tom Friedman said that the surefire way of making people fall asleep when uh, reading an article is to put European Union in the headline. So it was hard to write the book, but you're right. I'm a preacher because I have believed in the EU despite all of its manifold faults and defects, which we can all mention. But why do I? Why do I call it an essential partner that some people may say, you know, you're exaggerating? Well, because I lived it several times under Clinton White House, although those were early days, and more recently when I was in Brussels as Obama's ambassador. And I lived it certainly in trade. We failed to get TTIP over the line, but I lived it in trade. And I lived it in sanctions in a very direct way where the EU and the United States managed to align on very biting sanctions to roll them over every six months. And I was a witness, uh, uh, played a very small part also in the climate, you know, watching the climate negotiations in Paris, um, where we certainly have been essential partners during those eight years of Obama, we aligned in, in a rather dramatic way. And I say dramatic because for decades before that, we were out of sync with each other. In the 70s, the United States was actually more far reaching in environmental protection. And then the EU was really taking leadership. And during those eight unusual years, we were aligned. And you know what, we're not gonna get anything done on climate. Uh, you know, even, it, well, we won't get anything done unless the US and the EU really co-sponsor and push and get the Chinese, of course, to participate. And in the book, you know, to, to finish my answer quickly, in the book, I recount a lot of other areas which are perhaps less obvious. I talk about regulation. The EU is a superpower, although not in the typical sense. It's a trade superpower and it's a regulatory superpower. We've seen it in privacy and we've seen it in lots of digital economy issues as well. Partly because the US is, is withdrawn and partly because the EU isn't subject as much to regulatory, to, to capture, I should say, by lobbies. But I talk about military cooperation, somewhat unusually. I talk about law enforcement, and I talk about foreign aid, humanitarian assistance, and a number of other areas. So the short, the short answer, Eric, is that in quite a number of areas, the EU has tools which are unusual and sometimes even unique, which allow the United States to better achieve its objectives. Excellent. Well, I want to return to some of these issues, but let me turn first to Ambassador Haber. Um, I wanted to uh, ask you because not only are you representing, of course, your own country, Germany, in some ways, because of the German EU presidency uh, this fall, you're also representing uh, the European Union. So I wonder if you could give us a sense of what the top priorities are uh, for the German um, EU presidency agenda this fall, and how has this agenda been shaped by, by the COVID-19 pandemic, um, and how's that in turn you know, impacting your work here in Washington? Well, I can tell you the preparations that have gone uh, initially into uh, the German presidency uh, of the uh, council were completely different uh, than what turned out to be uh, the agenda. Of course, the uh, pandemic and the huge economic uh, contraction have uh, shaped our agenda. The economic contraction in, in Europe, that's the latest uh, IMF uh, prediction, uh, is more severe than in the United States. Uh, um, over the year uh, 2020, the downturn, uh, downturn will be over 8%, uh, whereas in the United States, uh, it's minus 4.3%. So that gives you, uh, that gives you a sense uh, of what we are actually uh, uh, confronted with. Now, let me, turn you, uh, let me turn back just for a minute to the uh, very initial moments of the crisis when we were really staring into an abyss because each health, um, health issues are national issues. And the sheer uh, dimension of the pandemic uh, made uh, individual countries very inward looking, uh, taking care of their own uh, and not practicing something which is really at the core of the normative clout of the European Union, and that is solidarity. And that was a very dangerous moment. 
And it was this dangerous moment um, uh, compounded by the uh, um, steep economic uh, decline uh, that made us uh, jettison previous orthodoxies, like for example, uh, now the commission will be able to uh, raise money uh, uh, on financial markets. They will, uh, if the recovery fund is finally adopted, uh, be able to uh, um, hand, uh, uh, hand out the money by credits, by loans, and uh, by uh, uh, grants. Uh, it's not a definite mutualization of debt, uh, but for the moment, uh, um, the, uh, it, it is a, a standalone, and that wouldn't have been possible previously. We also use the crisis in order to accelerate uh, uh, policies uh, uh, that are incredibly important for our planet, like climate change. Uh, but 30% of the EU's funds uh, will go to climate related projects. And we have uh, raised the level of ambition uh, to reach a, cl um, a climate neutral uh, state of affairs uh, in, uh, in Europe. Also digitization, one of the other uh, drivers of uh, um, innovation and technological change uh, will figure center stage uh, in the uh, recovery, 20% of the funds will be related to digitization, which is not relevant because um, the uh, geopolitical, uh, uh, geopolitics and geoeconomics today are very much determined uh, by a um, technological race in, uh, uh, in digital uh, economy, data economy, uh, uh, frontier technologies, uh, quantum computing uh, and so forth. And we need to be much more competitive we're changing, um, we're um, drawing lessons uh, um, from uh, the early um, uh, experiences in the pandemic, uh, which is we were much too dependent in, on value chains. We did not actually, we were not able to produce quick, coherent uh, uh, policies. There was no transparency on data. Uh, we did not join forces in, uh, in procurement and in searches. Uh, for um, uh, therapeutics uh, and vaccines. All of that has been uh, remedied by now. Uh, so we do see uh, in our presidency a really change, a, a, a cha well, a shift of paradigm, if you like. So all in all, um, if I look um, um, at the beginning of the crisis when we were at the cliff's edge and where we are now, even though the pandemic is hitting hard, has hard, hard again, the reactions are completely different. So we've seen, um, we've seen change um, and we are um, uh, entering on a course that will produce uh, um, more coherence uh, um, and more, um, um, more coherence, more uh, convergence uh, for the European Union. Uh, and I think uh, in, in taking that path, uh, we are we're heading into the right direction. Well, I know in political science, there is a theory that the EU makes progress during crises. So perhaps, you know, the EU, as you described, faced this almost existential crisis earlier this year, but was able to sort of come together and actually in some ways perhaps come up stronger after this crisis. I, I wonder, uh, Tony, if I can turn back to you. I mean, we've seen this type of evolution in the past. Um, the EU, um, you know, deepening its integration since, you know, um, when you started working on these issues back in the 1990s, we've certainly had, you know, enlargement, we've had the introduction of the Eurozone, the Lisbon Treaty, um, the EU responding to, to, to other crises it's faced um, in its neighborhood, be it, be it uh, migration, be it Brexit, be it Ukraine. Um, do you think that there is a uh, growing appreciation and awareness for the sort of, um, you know, um, increased uh, responsibilities that the European Union is, is, is achieving in the sort of Washington policy community? Or do you think that the sort of view of the EU is still, um, you know, somewhat outdated? Because I think sometimes when you, when, you, when you listen to the debates, at least in English speaking press, you often see headlines that the EU is at a breaking point or it's falling apart. Um, have you sensed that there is sort of a growing appreciation uh, with, with um, the Washington policy community that the EU is playing a more important role, both on addressing issues within Europe, but potentially also on, on some of these global issues that, that you've, you've described? 
Sure, there's been a huge evolution. You know, look, my views on the Trump administration are well known, so I won't rehearse them here. But the, you know, the president has said many things about the EU, saying it's worse than China, but just smaller. He said the EU is a consortium set up by Germany to beat us in trade, et cetera, et cetera. Well, these are gross caricatures that are nothing close to reality. Um, you know, the president thought that Brexit was terrific, there should be more Brexits, in fact, convinced that there would be and continue to ask heads of state, when would the next member leave? And of course, it hasn't left, and I never believed that another member would leave. But in general, look, there has been a lot more uh, understanding, appreciation, I think, uh, in Washington, uh, let's put it that way, uh, of the EU. I'll just tell you, when I arrived in 1994, take up my post. I was a young, I was a kid, practically 32 years old. I was the National Security Council. And there were, you know, a couple dozen of us, frankly, in the U.S. government really following the uh, European communities, right? Uh, I remember, I tell the story often, I remember calling Treasury and saying, well, wh what, do, what is our position on uh, the future single currency? And the answer was, we don't need to have one because it's never going to happen. And lo and behold, it happened. And I, of course, I thought, I thought it would happen because of political dynamics. But fast forward to today, you know, uh, there are a lot of people following this. I can tell you in all the calls we had on Privacy Shield, on sanctions and so on, blah, 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 we had, you know, armies of people dialing in throughout the U.S. government really focus on what EU positions are going to be. So in that sense, we've come a long way. And even among the journalistic community, I think there's a growing understanding that the EU really impacts uh, our ability to get things done. Yeah. Um, I think that's a great point that this this relationship, it's not just a relationship between diplomats at the State Department and the External Action Service in Brussels. It's a it's a relationship between a myriad of different uh, federal agencies and departments and different parts of, of the European Union institutions. Uh, but Ambassador Haber, I wanted to turn back to you and maybe if I could ask on a, a personal note, I mean, I know you travel a lot around the country, or at least you did before COVID, but you still you still talk regularly to Americans, um, you know, um, both here in Washington and Capitol Hill. But I know you you're in regular touch with governors and mayors and business people and representatives of civil society um, across the country. What, when you talk to Americans and you bring up the European Union, you know, what type of responses do you do you typically get from people? And I'm especially curious about how you talk to uh, Republicans, uh, because if you look at the Pew Research polls. Um, it suggests that the sort of perception of the EU in the United States uh, has increasingly become partisan, with 65% of, of Democrats having a positive view, but only 39% of Republicans. So how do you go about trying to reach Republicans? Do you talk more about trade or, or, or shared values? How, how do you engage when you, when you talk to Americans about issues related to the European Union? Well, it's true uh, that if I travel, um... Um, uh, across the country, which I haven't done since uh, uh, February, uh, I often uh, uh, note that there is not really understanding uh, for the principle of uh, transfer of sovereignty, uh, or um, there's not there is no understand or little understanding uh, that you can actually be a proud uh, sovereign nation uh, and transfer sovereignty in order to uh, uh, protect yourself, uh, and that in a globaliz in a globalized uh, world. Uh, countries, uh, European countries, or let me say it uh, uh, differently, the United States uh, is a continent in itself. It is a nuclear power, the uh, single most uh, powerful country in the world, uh, the largest economy uh, protected by uh, geography. Uh, so I, I do get it if people uh, don't understand the principle uh, of uh, pooling uh, sovereignty in order to uh, protect yourselves, but European countries, uh, in a different geography uh, are all small or medium-sized countries. And we don't stand a chance to defend ourselves in a globalized world, to stand our ground, uh, to defend the values, to defend the values that define our societies, uh, that define and determine uh, technology, which is where the race of the future is happening. Uh, we don't stand a chance if we don't pool sovereignty uh, in order to, uh, um, to use the aggregate power of 27 states uh, uh, when defending uh, our ground. So this is one of the points I make. And I also additionally uh, make the point that uh, um, given uh, the changing uh, uh, geopolitics, given the changing, massively changing uh, 
geopolitical landscape uh, uh, of the world. Uh, with the rise of China and the, uh, the relative decline uh, of Western uh, power, uh, it should be in our shared interest uh, to actually use each other as an asset uh, to leverage uh, um, uh, power projection. Um, because uh, the changing balance will not stop. Uh, it will continue probably to tilt. And we need all the alliances and like-minded and partnerships uh, that we have uh, in order to defend uh, what we feel is important. And that is the rule of law in, uh, of our societies, uh, our democratic cho uh, choices, uh, standards uh, that will define the technological uh, landscape in uh, the future. And as Ambassador Gardner has pointed out, uh, it's true um, in uh, power terms, uh, the EU is a regulatory superpower. You can easily see it when you look at the GDPR, uh, uh, which had been criticized, strongly criticized in, in its early days. But by now, all the big tech giants in the US uh, are actually impl basically implementing uh, uh, these rules, as do uh, over 100 countries across the world. So that's that's a good point, I, I think, in uh, uh, in, <clears throat> in um, showing to what degree, if we join uh, our forces and if we uh, seek uh, shared positions, uh, we can actually uh, define uh, the um, uh, the standard and rules environment in which. Uh, uh, the rise of China occurs, uh, or in which uh, actors, which are closely watching to what extent uh, we share opinions uh, or we are actually aligned, uh, will try to undermine uh, the sort of standards uh, uh, that, that we are seeking. So it's actually not only about European power uh, or the capacity of uh, the European Union, uh, um, it is about our shared capacity uh, to to hold ground. Yeah, and and I think you know, yeah, Tony, please. Uh, this is such an important question. Sorry if I, I jump in, Eric. You asked such an important question. It's so sad that this has become a partisan issue, because it wasn't that way before. I can tell you, there wasn't a single day I was at Post that I felt I was promoting a democratic agenda with the EU. I don't think any of my predecessors, Republican included, thought that for a second. You know, these are issues which are bipartisan. I'll give you just a couple of examples. I don't want to go on too long. Law enforcement, that's not a partisan issue. The United States has an interest in working with Europe, including with the European Union, in combating serious crime and, and terrorism. And Europol is a good example. Those are three, three times. It's not well known in the United States, but it's evolved dramatically to be a real you know, effective force in combating terrorism. The second issue, energy security. That should not be a partisan issue. Both Republicans and Democrats care about energy security in Europe, both through diversification of routes and, and supply. Um, and the word regulation, again, was used by the ambassador. And I lived it and I see it. I can tell you, we have a window here. The Chinese, in their astute, long-sighted, you know, way, have identified the control of international standard setting organizations being critical to lock in an advantage for their exporters and their values. And together, if the US and the EU actually were to work together to ensure that their values and standards were enshrined around the world, we would really make great progress. And that's not a partisan issue either. And finally, finally, also mentioned by the ambassadors, the importance of working to make sure that China reforms its abusive trade investment practices by changing also the rules of the WTO. None of that's partisan. So Eric, it's so sad that it's become this divisive issue. Well, you write, Tony, in your book that this sort of bipartisan American support for European integration uh, has been something very longstanding, dating back to John F. Kennedy, who spoke about a united Europe as, as an important partner for the United States. But I wonder, I mean, why do you think it is that this issue has become more partisan? And what is it that you think, you've been very critical, as you say, about the Trump administration's approach. What is it that they get wrong about the EU? They seem to um, you know, em emphasize the EU as just an international multilateral organization that, that sort of goes against the sovereignty of member states. They seem to see the EU as an economic competitor. Um, but you know, what is it that you think that they are missing when they are looking at, at, at the EU? And, and what effects is that having on, on this relationship? 
Well, Eric, I'll be brief. Of course, this president doesn't like the fact that the EU magnifies the leverage and the power of the 28, soon to be 27 member states. He'd rather deal one by one and pick them off as easy prey, to put it very bluntly. So it's rather irritating for him that you have a very competent, effective negotiator called the European Commission representing 28. But beyond that, there is this view, the ambassador mentioned, that multilateralism is for wimps. You know, if you're a strong power, you're a big gorilla in the jungle, why do you need things like the UN or international law and international institutions? But that's so fundamentally flawed. It's so fundamentally flawed because if you start introducing the law of the jungle, then everybody loses. And we've seen it in so many very concrete ways. I'll just cite you one example. When we invoke national security exemption willy-nilly, you know, even when it's a pretext to impose aluminum and steel sanctions, other countries will follow suit. And we saw in the case of Russia, we saw in the case of Saudi Arabia, other countries are doing the same. And then you see a slow degrading of this entire system of rules, which have, it, the thing that many Americans don't understand is these actually have helped us. We, we need the protection of intellectual property. We need the you know, protection of these rules and values. Otherwise, you know, our exports, uh, you know, suffer and our interests suffer. So the, the last thing I'll say, you know, the view here in the UK where I am today is, is for some the same. You know, multilateralism somehow subtracts from your power. But that's a fundamentally flawed concept in my view. I wanted to turn back to you, Ambassador Haber. I mean, how would you characterize uh, the state of EU-US relations today? I mean, we obviously you can pick up the newspaper on any given day and you can read about the political turbulence. But in, on the other hand, it seems that some of these current challenges we're facing, be it burden sharing, be it defense spending, uh, Nord Stream 2, trade issues, they're not necessarily new. They've been around for a long time. Um, so what do you think are some of the underlying dynamics uh, shaping this current turbulence that we're seeing in the relationship? And are, are there any silver linings here, um, such as Europe maybe stepping up and, and doing more, taking more responsibility, or, or um, you know, some of these issues that Ambassador Gardner mentioned that are maybe not as sexy like cooperation on um, counterterrorism and law enforcement, but these things continue uh, despite the sort of sometimes rocky politics. How would you describe the, the, the current state of the relationship? Is yes. it as bad as it seems in the headlines sometimes? These things continue uh, as you uh, pointed out. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, Ambassador Gardner, you said perhaps law cooperation on law enforcement uh, does not gain a lot of purchase in publicity but it's hugely important. And as someone who served in Homeland Security, I can tell you it's a crucial element. So let me say this, uh, um, it's not entirely new that uh, the United States uh, um, has had in, at times a preference for, uh, bilateral, uh, um, for bilateral approaches. Um, in foreign policy and security policy, the uh, EU is a very slow partner because it depends on uh, cons the consensus principle. Um, and that has always produced at times uh, situations where the United States preferred to uh, seek um, bilateral alignment uh, um, instead of um, uh, uh, looking for a consensus with the 27, uh, not least because a consensus of the 27 uh, would obviously uh, water down initial uh, uh, and more pure uh, uh, positions. Um, I guess what, and on trade, uh, Ambassador Gardner has made the point, on trade, uh, we are equals, equals. Uh, we are equally strong, uh, and therefore uh, the European Union has an impact on uh, important decisions the United States uh, uh, will have to, uh, uh, is taking on tax issues, on data privacy, uh, um, on uh, data regulation and so forth. So um, this bilateral in uh, inclination is something uh, that, was always uh, there somehow, um, but what the you know, what the United States uh, at the end of the day uh, will have to decide uh, whether it uh, uh, finds it more promising uh, to seek um, alignment around uh, around uh, purely American positions, or whether uh, it prefers uh, the um, uh, potential for maximizing. Uh, um, the uh, power projection uh, uh, by uh, 
um, uh, by predicating uh, its position on an alignment with the EU 27, even if this alignment is uh, uh, is uh, reached uh, um, uh, through compromise and uh, through negotiations and so forth. Mm -hmm. But it actually will allow to leverage, uh, and that is important. And uh, returning to the underlying uh, uh, the underlying uh, uh, structures, well, I mentioned it already. Uh, the world is changing. The balance in the world is changing. Our uh, relative clout uh, is uh, declining. So I'd, I'd always make the case, uh, let's join forces uh, and let's make sure uh, uh, that we ha have a common ground which is as large and as strong as possible uh, in order to push back uh, where standards or policies uh, or behavior is actually uh, a threat to us. And that is better done uh, um, uh, by uh, by uh, uh, joining forces. In bilateral situations, it's true, uh, the, uh, the United States will always have more uh, relative asymmetric, uh, asymmetric power, but you never exist only in bilateral situations. Uh, and in multilateral situations, this uh, rule of asymmetric power uh, is irrelevant. I think that's a great point. And I, I wanna try to get to some of those issues um, where we could see, you know, deeper cooperation on, on, on issues that you mentioned, maybe China, technology and other issues. But I wanted to first ask you, um, Tony, since you're based in the UK and you have a lot of experience also working on um, issues related to, to Europe and the UK, I mean, you know, what does it mean for, for US interests that the UK has left the European Union? Um, you know, are you concerned that, you know, this could actually make the EU a less useful and potentially powerful partner for the United States? I mean, the sort of second biggest economy in Europe, second biggest military player uh, with, with an international diplomatic clout. Um, and are you concerned that after Brexit, the EU itself may take a more perhaps protectionist direction or a slightly less sort of open global direction? And should, you know, how should the US go about rebuilding its own influence in Europe after Brexit, you know, which which other countries become more important for the US to sort of make up for that special role that Britain has traditionally played in sort of um, being like-minded with the United States on a lot of issues related to, to EU affairs? Sure, you know, I'm reminded of, uh, I just want to return for a second to what the ambassador was saying. You know, I'm reminded by a, 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 an old Zulu uh, adage that says, if you want to go fast, you go alone. If you want to uh, go far, you go together. And it's so true, I witnessed this as well. Sometimes we tore our hair out, you know, during the sanctions debate about how slow the EU is, my God, you know, we got to stiffen their spines. But if you want to go far, you go together. That's my view. Do we want a partner or do we want a poodle? If we want a poodle to kick around, then Donald Trump is the right way to go. If you want a partner, it implies the partner has the right to disagree, by the way. The partner has the right to have his own policies. And uh, I, I would suggest that a partner also should have the right to have his own autonomous defense capabilities. And it's not just a question of us selling US military equipment to the Europeans. It, it, it's a totally different mindset. But to your question about you know, Brexit, I was very clear in my book, you know, we did a lot of work, a lot of analytical work to describe and understand what we thought the consequences of Brexit would be. And I think those, those analyses have been proved right meaning that uh, for the UK, you know, leaving a larger group would make it less uh, weighty in the world. Um, the UK will find a rather co more cold and forbidding place, who has le less influence. Uh, we were also concerned that shorn of the UK, the EU would lose some capabilities. We saw it on sanctions. The UK played a critical role on sanctions, critical role on law enforcement, critical role on security issues. So yes, it's a net negative. I think everybody would agree with the EU. Uh, so we were sorry for that reason for the UK uh, to, to, to leave. Um, we also thought it was the wrong decision for the UK itself, but that's, that was for a sovereign decision for the UK to decide. Will it make it more complicated for the United States? Absolutely. i just give you one anecdote. You know, I was on the phone with my counterpart, the UK perm rep, the ambassador, uh, you know, three times a week, sometimes even more on sanctions and on privacy and day, data and digital because of the alignment of interests was so great. With the UK out, it'll be so much more complicated to construct alliances of the willing 
but you know they're, they're there but it'll take more it'll take a lot more work and uh finally i'll say something which i i hope is not too provocative because i, I think it's uh you know uh, it's even-handed in the sense that um the uk was a third leg in the triad um france germany and uk now there's a, there's a duo with france being the much weaker member uh and i say this with great respect for Germany's role. Uh, it was sincerely held, and I saw it many times that Germany has played such a stable leading role in key moments of European and EU history. But it's not entirely a, uh, a comfortable position to be in when two and sometimes one country exercises uh, such significant control of the direction of the European Union, even though that leadership has been uh, you know, very, very positive in my view. Um, so, you know, it's a question of the stability of the construct when a core member like the UK leaves. That is a concern for the future. Mm -hmm. And of course, Ambassador Haber will, will have probably some big changes also in Germany soon with Chancellor Merkel announcing that she will step down and we'll have elections in Germany and then elections in 2022 in, in France. So potentially big uh, political changes underway. But I wanted to bring in some questions from the audience. Um, and, and direct them to you. Um, one question we received from Elena is that we often hear the Europeans using the term strategic autonomy uh, more and more to, to describe um, the EU's vision. But what does this mean for you know, transatlantic relations? Um, and you know, sh should Americans be concerned about a Europe that is seeking to become more independent or is this actually, um, could this actually be beneficial for the United States with sort of a Europe being able to share more more of the burden. How's this viewed from, from your perspective and from Berlin's perspective? Um, well, I would point out uh, that the term uh, European sovereignty or European autonomy is, not, is somewhat ill-defined um, because different, uh, different people mean different things uh, uh, over there. From my point of view, it, it is uh, a, dire a direction that we want to uh, take. Uh, setting uh, conditions that will allow us uh, uh, to um, uh, well, to, uh, to go ahead and not burden, uh, for example, a transatlantic partner. Let me uh, explain it uh, um, uh, in the context of two projects, and that is uh, PESCO uh, and the EDF. Um, on PESCO, uh, I sometimes uh, hear critical questions of partners uh, what do you mean? Uh, are you going to decouple? Are you going to duplicate uh, something that NATO does much better? And my answer is no. Uh, we're actually what we're trying to do is uh, um, um, be uh, be able to uh, create, set up, uh, and send missions in a sustainable way uh, without uh, um, recurring uh, to the United States. Uh, and if we are <laughs> If we are stabilizing uh, our home base, how can that not benefit uh, the transatlantic alliance? And the same is true uh, with regard to the uh, EDF, which is actually trying, uh, where well, we're actually trying uh, uh, to um, uh, create uh, ben um, economies of scale, uh, where we're trying to uh, produce uh, or defragmentize a very fragment, uh, fragmented uh, defense. Uh, 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 landscape uh, in um, an industry landscape and research landscape uh, in the European Union. How is that not of uh, 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 an advantage uh, for the United States? Look, the, uh, I mentioned a couple of times already, the big challenges of our time are not in Europe anymore. They're elsewhere. And American uh, attention will be drawn uh, to, uh, to other regions of the world, which in turn means uh, that the Europeans need to shoulder more responsibility and need to be able to take uh, decisions and, respons and responsibility uh, in their own uh, geography. That is not decoupling, that is actually producing a strategic asset necessary, uh, both for the transatlantic alliance uh, uh, and for the United States. So my argument uh, would be, uh, um, you should call for more European uh, autonomy. You should be uh, calling for more European capacities uh, and more uh, European uh, responsibility because that's what's needed in our time. Relationships change uh, and the European Union uh, is no more uh, the European communities uh, it was uh, in the time, say, of the uh, Cold War. Today, um, in, uh, against the backdrop uh, 
of changing uh, geopolitics, the European Union uh, needs to stand more uh, on its own feet. And that is in our shared interest. Mm -hmm. um, I want to bring in some more questions from the audience. We have a, we have a lot of questions, actually. And I think um, Sarah asked the sort of million dollar question. And I wanted to see if I could uh, post that to you, Ambassador Gardner. Uh, she asks about the outcome of the US election. We're obviously just a couple, away from, a couple of weeks away from November 3rd. Um, and if Trump were to be reelected, do you see this relationship continuing to get worse or you know, could it improve? I, I recall a lot of European diplomats um, you know, telling me that when George W. Bush was reelected, he made sort of a concerted effort to reach out to Europeans and sort of try to repair some of the damage after the Iraq war. Could that happen again? Or do you think it will be more of the same if Trump's reelected? And conversely, uh, if we were to have a Biden administration in the White House in the end of January, you know, what would its priorities be towards the European Union? How would that impact uh, the relationship in your view? Uh, yeah, Donald Trump is no George Bush, I would say that, you know, one in one sentence. So I do not think things would get better. It, it would require a healthy dose of optimism uh, to believe that they would get better. I think we would see more of the same, uh, more unilateral sanctions, perhaps even, uh, you know, uh, more import tariffs on European goods, uh, more friction uh, directed, unfortunately, uh, at Germany and, and other members of the EU. Um, we would continue to see, I think, administration that would ignore the ability of the EU to be helpful to the United States and some core interests. I mentioned China being one of them. Look, if we were lucky enough um, to, in my view, if, if, if Biden is elected, we would see a significant, uh, both a change, but a reversion to mean. That's the important point to stress. It's not a partisan issue. Uh, Donald Trump has jumped the rails after 60 years of bipartisan foreign policy. So we, I think we would immediately see a statement of support for European integration for the European Union. I hope we would see a, an early visit to Brussels, both to support the EU and NATO. We would see a statement of support for, for NATO as a linchpin of transatlantic security. Uh, I think, you know, there's look, the whole raft of measures that the campaign is working on I know, uh, that could be implemented quite quickly, even in the first couple months uh, or the first half year, bo both in trade uh, and in security and otherwise, that I think are relatively uncontroversial. I won't go through the whole list, but uh, I would like to see the elimination of um, tariffs on industrial goods trade. We did it, in, we agreed it in, T in TTIP, we can do it now. Uh, there would have to be some movement on agriculture. There are a few ideas there. I think we should be able to resolve the Boeing Air, Airbus dispute. There are a lot of things that we can do, uh, and some with a longer time horizon. Uh, and I hate to, to, to mention this again, but I think the role of standards is really crucial. You know, there's legislation before the House right now. Um, I forgot what the name of the bill that asks for a study, first 100 days, about how our interests are being um, potentially eroded by our failure to uh, together, you know, write the standards uh, with our allies. Um, and the Chinese have announced a 2035 plan, I think, regarding standards. What does that mean? Um, plus COVID, we should be working with the EU immediately, preparing for global pandemic preparedness, also for the future, supply chain diversification, resilience, a whole bunch of things. So the message is I'm quite optimistic. I really am optimistic that if we have a change in regime, the, there are a lot of things we could do quite quickly together. Uh, Ambassador Haber, I mean, regardless of the outcome of the election, it seems that the agenda, um, the future agenda for, for cooperation, a lot of the issues will probably be the same. Uh, we're, we're discussing China, we're discussing technology, trade. Where do you see the greatest prospects for, for deeper cooperation? Where do you think we um, perhaps could do more than we have been doing in the past? Um, where do you see opportunities for for um, you know, increasing cooperation between the European Union and the United States going forward? Well, um, many of the issues have been mentioned by Ambassador uh, Gardner already. Um, but I would say this, in this year, we've seen, it, in addition to the hugely disruptive uh, 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 force of climate change, uh, the equally hugely disruptive force of uh, the pandemic. And up to now, we've only debated this in the context of, uh, in the context of how our, our countries have fared and uh, how the European Union have fared. But there's the rest of the world, uh, and we've uh, uh, who are incredibly affected, uh, and where we 
are not seeing as yet the uh, light at the end of the uh, tunnel. So I would say uh, uh, cooperating on climate change uh, on the one hand, but also uh, um, working together um, uh, in the context of our shared responsibility uh, for, um, for the world we live in. Um, and that includes um, um, foreign aid, and that includes uh, humanitarian assistance, uh, and that includes, uh, well, as I said, uh, um, our planet. So that is one area. And the second area, and, but this has been explained uh, in detail by Ambassador Gardner, uh, obviously on all issues uh, related to the economy, uh, to data, uh, to um, uh, data privacy, to uh, digital. Uh, that's a huge field uh, and much needs to be done. And uh, lastly, uh, all security uh, uh, issues from uh, sanctions. Actually, there uh, we are working together uh, uh, closely. In recent days, uh, we've taken decision, uh, or we worked together in taking decisions with regard to Belarus and with regard uh, uh, to Russia. So we're not in a bad place in the context uh, of uh, uh, sanctions. But security goes far beyond uh, sanctions. And sanctions is just a minor tool of foreign uh, uh, policy. Uh, there is also uh, law enforcement. Uh, um, you have mentioned uh, energy security. All of these are aspects uh, um, of, uh, uh, of security as well. So it's a huge field. Uh, but I would say that uh, we should certainly uh, intensify our cooperation uh, in, or in the area of uh, climate change, uh, biodiversity, uh, um, uh, handling uh, um, foreign aid and humanitarian assistance, uh, um, setting aside uh, the uh, trade and economic context, uh, which is obviously uh, um, a center stage. Yeah. Um, Ambassador Gardner, I wonder if I could sort of drill down on two issues that we received a lot of questions on. One is trade and the other one is uh, digital and technology issues. I mean, on trade, when you were ambassador, you were, you know, busy promoting TTIP. We didn't reach the finish line. I mean, you know, what should we be aiming for in the trade area? Should we try to return to those nego negotiations or should we, you know, put that, is that still on the back burner and look to other issues? Maybe it's about standard setting and WTO reform. What do you think the trade agenda should be? What, what's the most realistic and constructive approach there? And then on, on technology, um, you know, uh, it seems like in many ways, you know, the, the word from Brussels these days is digital sovereignty, uh, that the EU is increasingly uh, using its regulatory power, or as one of our non-resident non fellows as Carnegie, Anna Bradford has put it, the Brussels effect to uh, regulate the tech sector. Um, do you see that as being, you know, an area where the US and the EU can cooperate, or do you see rather a fragmentation with each side kind of going their own way? Um, and, and, you know, this could also become an even more tense uh, issue going forward with things like digital taxation, um, with, with antitrust, um, and, and with, you know, other issues on, on the tech agenda. Or is there rather a convergence because of rising debates in the U.S. on some of these same issues? Well, great, huge questions. Uh, let me just start quickly by saying how much I agree with Ambassador Haber. I know it's boring to keep on agreeing, but I really agree with this, this point that burden sharing is so much broader than just, you know, how much you spent on military equipment. A lot of Americans seem to think that's the litmus test, but climate change, you know, combating climate change, well, that's sharing a burden. Migration, not talked about, that's sharing a burden. And you know what? hate to sound like a preacher again, but on the last two, on climate and on migration, Europe is actually bearing more of the burden. Now, I agree, military spending is hugely important, but let me just say, burden sharing is a broad topic. On the question of TTIP, no, of course we're not going to go back to TTIP for reasons that we can't wind back the clock. Donald Trump has existed. We can't wish him away. And by the way, everything, the phenomena that brought him to power is something that will endure. There's a frustration and a skepticism about free trade. And a lot of those reasons I think are entirely legitimate. Let's be clear about it. So we can't, I think, go back to the days of hugely ambitious trade agreements for a lot of reasons, but there is, there is a series of things we can do that will prove the case 
for uh, you know, li liberalization in certain areas of trade that will result in greater exports and job creation. To just go through a quick list, I mentioned one, eliminating tariffs on industrial goods trade, eminently doable. Uh, reducing the number of areas where we have frictions on so-called plant and animal health, the sanitary and phytosanitary provisions. There are a few things we can do there. I mentioned the Airbus-Boeing dispute. Um, I think we can try to get also a free trade agreement with, uh, with the UK. I hope it's possible. We can expand a recent agreement, which was rather technical but important, on mutual recognition of pharmaceutical uh, products. Uh, non-safety auto regulation, so-called functional equivalence to say basically that we are regulation is slightly different, but you know, get to the same place. Uh, we can drive reform of WTO rules. So that's just a short list of things that we can actually do that falls <clears throat> below a, you know, a big, big agreement, but are, but are important. You know, on digital, absolutely crucial we work together. You know, it's critical that we avoid a splinter net, having the Chinese rules, European rules, and American rules. So it would be a disaster. But you know what? We may be in an alignment because now the House has just published this very voluminous report where, you know, it got a significant amount of bipartisan support for some of its recommendations. There is a changing view in the United States about a greater unease about the power that some of the platforms have. And a growing view, certainly shared in the EU, that antitrust rules are not the only and perhaps not the most appropriate tools to address some of those concerns, whether it's about dissemination of propaganda and fake news and, and you know, interference in our elections, all, all of these things, um, and, and, and unease about the business model that's at the core of some of these uh, companies and the way they make money. So you know, I think absolutely the top of the list, Eric, if we have a change in administration, we really should sit down with the EU and say we should be putting our heads together, our regulators together, to see whether we can draft you know, similar rules. Also, by the way, on artificial intelligence, what does ethical AI look like? Writing standards or facial recognition, uh, you know, in smart cities and so on. Uh, and we don't want the Chinese to be setting the rules worldwide. Another issue, I mean, speaking of China, Ambassador Haber, another issue is of course, you know, how there's been in some ways, a, you know, a growing convergence in terms of US and European perceptions of China, at least as an economic challenge to the sort of rules-based multilateral trade order. Um, you know, how do you see, you know, uh, this issue? It seems like uh, Europe has increasingly, you know, become um, concerned about these issues. It's taken a number of steps, investment screening, um, you know, trying to address um, the issue of, un you know, unleveled playing field with China. Uh, is there room to do more together with the US here on China? We've certainly seen uh, Secretary Pompeo engage High Representative Borrell on the need to have sort of an EU-US sort of a strategic council to discuss China issues. What issues do you think should be on the agenda there? And, you know, how could we actually move uh, to, to have practical cooperation on some of these issues that relates to China? Well, China is so big a challenge that um, whether we agree or disagree on tackling, uh, taking on this challenge uh, will have an impact uh, on the uh, bilateral relationship between the EU and China, uh, uh, between the EU and the uh, United States. So you said uh, we agreed on the economic challenge. Actually, we agree on more because China is no more only an economic China. Uh, um, uh, uh, challenge, uh, to what degree it is a systemic rival, uh, has been demonstrated by its actions in, uh, in Hong Kong, where it replaced uh, the rule of law with an authoritarian regime. You're right uh, when you pointed out uh, uh, that um, Pollyanna is thinking on China is really uh, something of a, his, its history, it's over. Uh, nationally and the EU too, uh, we've taken uh, pretty tough decisions on investment screening uh, we are having very intense discussions on uh, uh, on the 5g net and uh, uh, the security uh, of them so i think we're pretty realistic and we agree with much of the american analysis uh, um, on on economic but also on uh, other issues we agree uh, that um, uh, forced uh, technology transfer is unacceptable we agree on um, on intellectual uh, property, we agree on market access. Uh, 
uh, we agree on uh, that joint, uh, enforced joint ventures are unacceptable and, uh, and so forth. Um, we agree on the nature of the political uh, challenge uh, too. And we agree that we need to push back and we had best done it uh, um, uh, jointly. I'm not quite sure whether we always agree on the level of ambition. Um, if I hear uh, about uh, decoupling discussions here, uh, I'm not quite sure where this is headed. Uh, do you actually want, uh, does that mean decoupling of, in, of certain uh, economies, uh, uh, health industries, uh, for example, uh, of making sure that uh, uh, value chains uh, are not uh, vulnerable. So is it partial deglobalization in the tech sector or, and in the health sector, or is it more? And decoupling in itself is not an objective. It, decoupling is, uh, uh, is to achieve something. So what is the uh, intended objective? Is it to stop the rise of China or even reverse it? If that's the case, uh, well, uh, we differ on you know, underlying assumptions. I personally don't think that this can, it can be stopped. But what we can do, and what we can do if we proceed uh, jointly, is that we define uh, the conditions of the environment uh, in which we interact uh, uh, with uh, China. Uh, we can jointly uh, define uh, uh, the, um, uh, the terms of coexistence, uh, if you like. But there's a difference between uh, um, saying you can actually coerce by policies China into a change of behavior, in, into a change of policies, uh, and possibly uh, thereby stop uh, uh, the rise. That's, I think, uh, beyond what we can actually do. Um, but uh, achieving uh, um, uh, or determining the environment uh, and changing the range of options uh, uh, China has when pursuing uh, uh, aggressive policies, that is within what we can actually do. And that's where we should focus on uh, uh, when, uh, when defining uh, joint policies in the future. Yeah, we're, we're beginning to near the end of, of this conversation, but I wanted to turn back to you, Ambassador Gardner. I mean, in some ways, it seems like, you know, this relationship between the European Union and the US is maybe somewhat outdated institutionally, that we're not really uh, set up in, in a way that actually can make this an effective relationship. I mean, I've heard countless stories from American diplomats complaining about EU-US summits as being, you know, extremely, you know, tiresome and they have to listen to 27 European leaders and it's not, it's not effective. So, you know, if you were to, you know, imagine how we could reinvent this relationship and actually make it more strategic, um, what would be some of the things that you would want to see in terms of, in terms of just improving the institutional mechanics of, of this relationship to, to, to make it more, make it more effective on addressing the issues that, that we've discussed here? That's a, it's a really hard question and you're right. I was at quite a few US EU summits under two presidents and uh, there was kind of bewilderment sometimes amongst the US participants. Some of them would look out at the other side of the table and see all these people and they would ask, well, who are they? What are they, what are they doing? And it was very hard to describe sometimes you know, why he had, in the, you know, when he had the rotating presidency and so on, you had a lot of people on the other side. Um, so look, it's not a great way. And usually they're too short and not much is accomplished, but you need them because leading up to those summits, things need to be decided and announced. The summits in and of themselves are not exactly great events. So I would keep them. I don't think they're needed perhaps twice a year. I think more importantly, they're, uh, even though I'm a, I'm a bit allergic to setting up new institutions, uh, I think there probably is a need for having a US EU Trade and Technology Council that really focuses on the issue of standards and standard setting. Um, I, I think that really would rank one of the top three. Um, but the, the reality is, Eric, that a lot of the day-to-day -day business is handled, uh, you know, at granular level between offices um, and through embassies. You don't need, I think, new institutions. So I would be very cautious about setting up yet more, you know, councils. Mm -hmm. One good council has been the U.S. EU Energy Council. Uh, again, the actual meetings are pretty underwhelming. I, would, I went to several of them, but leading up to them, it forced the institution, it forced the officials to actually say, oh my God, we actually have to announce something. Let's actually make progress. So 
I, you know, I, I think it would be unfair to be too dismissive of them. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, we're basically at the end, but I wanted to give you a chance, Ambassador Hubbard, if you want to give us any, you know, parting thoughts uh, based on this conversation. And also, I know you, you, you read and made a lot of notes in in Ambassador Gardner's book. So, you know, if you want to share some of your uh, takeaways from from the book and takeaways from this conversation, um, now is your now is your chance. Uh, um, among all large international actors. Um, I think the United States uh, has not a closer ally than the European Union. We're closer to you than any other large international organization uh, that you are not uh, part of. Um, and that is, uh, uh, that implies huge uh, uh, possibilities that we should, uh, we should be using. I have found, uh, I, I do un understand at times, uh, when uh, people are exasperated uh, with the multitude of actors within the European Union, uh, with the complicated decision-making, uh, uh, with the consensus principle. But its consensus, uh, in its consensus lies its force. And also uh, the degree of being an asset uh, uh, to, the United, uh, to the United States as well. Uh, we have at times lost the sense uh, for the uh, for the potential uh, when focusing uh, on the uh, maddening, uh, ploddingly um, uh, uh, negotiations uh, or uh, interactions. But the potential is unique, uh, and uh, let's not forget uh, what is. There's one marvelous um, um, passage in the book. Uh, and it's, you quote Freud, I believe, uh, and you say, uh, you talk about the uh, um, uh, narcissism of trivial differences. Was it called that? Uh, was it called? I think in the EU-US uh, relationship and the way it's being perceived, you see a lot of uh, the uh, narcissism of trivial differences. I think that's a perfect note to end uh, that despite, you know, the sometimes difficulties in this relationship, we actually remain uh, very close and aligned with shared values and shared interests in a world that's increasingly looking uh, complex. So I want to, I want to thank both of you, uh, Ambassador Emily Haber and Ambassador Anthony Gardner um, for spending this time with us and congrats again, um, Tony, to your book. It's a great read. We recommend that everyone reads it and thanks also to Dan for um, working with us on this event. So thanks everyone for joining and we look forward to seeing you soon again. Thanks. Bye-bye.